So we've been talking culture and counterculture. We're going to take a little bit of a detour. It is related. We're going to talk about condemnation today. It is related uh, to culture and to what we've been doing. And the, and, and the reason I say that is because so now we're getting into different ideologies. So we talked about uh, the importance of counterculture, especially for uh, this day and age, and we talk about it's really the church in this day and age that's going to be the counterculture. Uh, there's other people that are not necessarily Christian, uh, but, they, but they are standing against uh, culture today as well. So we talked about that. We talked about the importance of the church countering those things in culture that are anti-Bible, anti-God, anti-Christ. And, and we know that not every single thing Thing in culture is anti-God, but there is so much. So we talked about that. We started out that way, went through, you know, what's going on in culture, the reasons we should be standing, gave example of people standing, um, uh, uh, biblical examples as well as natural examples uh, in our contemporary society, um, like during the civil rights movement, that was a counterculture, right? So we talked about all of that, and then so then we started getting into, oh, now we're starting to get into ideology. So I feel like it's going to be a little bit more controversial, and it may be a little bit difficult for some people to take, or for many of us to take, because now we're going to start talking, talking about ideologies. We started with abortion, and we're not finished with that yet, but I wanted to bring... A reprieve today, and you see what I mean and why I felt like I had to do it. But anyway, so now we're getting into ideologies. We're getting, we started with the abortion. We're still doing that. We talked when we started with the abortion. We talked about um, biblically, biblically, when life began. Uh, we had a that day. I had a um, a model of a fetus. I didn't have it. I had it the next Sunday because I didn't have it that Sunday, but I talked about 12-week development of a fetus in utero. So we talked about all of that, and then talked about gay scriptures from the Word of God about when God considers life to begin, right? And then last week, we talked scientifically. We talked about science and when science says life began, and we were able to see with that Scientifically, there is an agreement with the Word of God for those scientists that are honest. There is an agreement with the Word of God that life begins at conception. Amen. So we talked about all that. And that's the day that I had the, uh, the, uh, the fetus in my hand, the model of a fetus in my hand, because a, a 12-week uh, developed fetus, and you know, usually around that time or after that time is when abortions happen. But a 12-week fetus, I had it in my hand, it fits in my hand because it's, it's uh, if I remember, it's not even, it's just a few ounces, is that, um, and, and then it's, the, uh, it's about 
not even quite an inch, I think, and it fit, it can fit in the palm of your hand. But that fetus is is, is uh, everything about that fetus is uh, there. It's just development now. You know, the organs, the heart, the hearing, the emotions, all of that stuff is there. But now it's under develop, it's under development. So uh, so we talked about that. So what I want to do today, though, and I'm gonna pick up talking about abortion again next week. But what I want to do today is I want to talk about condemnation because, see, people, what we're doing when we're going through culture and counterculture, it's not about condemnation. And I want to make that clear today with Scripture. It's not about condemnation. It's not God trying to condemn you for what you have done, for what you believe once, or what you may believe now. It's not Him bringing condemnation. It's Him bringing enlightenment. And enlightenment to your life so that you can see if you are espousing certain, certain ideas and if you have governed yourself according to those ideas so you can see that the ideas that you have uh, are, are anti-God, anti the word of God. But sometimes though, when we talk about truth and especially if the truth finds us in a place where we are not complying with it, it could bring condemnation. Or if we have been if we have been involved, uh, like maybe there was a time, like for me, you know, there was a time in my life, of course, when I was involved in homosexuality. So it, it it's possible, it's possible, but it doesn't happen to me because I got the word of God down pat on it. But it is possible that if I were to hear a sermon on homosexuality of, of people who have been down that road and it's a straight up sermon, it could be um, condemning because it could take you back to a time, right? And so I want to come to you for the word today so you can get a handle on condemnation because we need to be able to hear the truth without being condemned, right? Because the truth is the Bible says you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Sanctify them with your truth, Jesus said. What is truth? Your word is true, right? True. And uh, sanctify means to set them apart. Set us apart. We are set apart for, for God by truth. Amen. When, when you hear the truth about abortion from the word of God, even scientifically, when you hear the truth about homosexuality, when you hear the truth about adultery, whatever the case may be, it sets you apart if you receive that truth. It sets you apart from the world, right? And so that calls, so you can't, so that, so there, you cannot be counter culture unless you are set apart from culture. And you cannot be set apart from culture unless you know the truth from the Word of God. Amen. But if you are condemned when you hear the truth, then it's going to be very difficult. For you to receive the truth. I know that from experience. And I'm sure those of you who are listening to me. Many of you who are listening to me. You know that from experience. You know when you look back. There there was times when you heard the truth. And you could not receive it. Because you were so condemned. And that's a trick of the enemy. Because condemnation does not come from God. And so whenever you are sensing condemnation. You need to resist it. Now, let me tell you the difference, kind of give you a way to know the difference between combination and conviction, to know when you are being convicted and when you are being condemned. Now, conviction is just telling you that something you are doing is wrong. You know, you may, and saying that conviction doesn't always come from the pulpit. You, you could be convicted and you haven't even been to church. Uh, this week, this month, because you have, especially you're born again, you have, the, the, what does the scripture say about people who are born again? It says, if any man is in Christ, those are born again people, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are new. Talking about the spirit of you, not your flesh, not your soul. Um, but uh, So that, that spirit of you that is born again can, can convict you when you do things that are contrary to the word of God, because that scripture, is, I'm not that scripture, your spirit is tied to God. Your spirit wants to do right. Your spirit has the desire to do right. So your spirit is always going to 
do the right thing. That's why there's often a struggle, and everybody knows this. Everybody who is born again, and you probably encounter this. I know I did encounter this before you got born again. But particularly when you go, when you're born again, there's this pronounced struggle between your spirit and your flesh because your flesh always wants to do evil, and your spirit always wants to do good. And so they uh, of Galatians five tells us that they wrestle against each other. Right, so you can have you could be convicted that way. Just just come through your spirit. So conviction is just saying that you that something that you're doing something wrong. Like for me, uh, when I, I got convicted of homosexuality, of course, before I even got saved. But um, but I got convicted of homosexuality. Then of course, I got born again. You know the story. I was born again for about three years. Then here come homosexuality right back, and I let it in because I didn't know how to resist it. And then God showed me I got delivered again. And then God showed me what to do because I asked him. And so because of that, it's been um, 33 plus years that I've been involved in homosexuality because I know how to keep homosexuality from coming back in. And what I'm going to show you today is one of the things that kept it out. But when I was struggling with homosexuality, there was a conviction that says this is wrong. That's all conviction says. This is wrong. What you are doing is wrong. because of, and, and conviction is necessary because otherwise you wouldn't know to repent. You wouldn't know to change. You wouldn't know that I need to make a change in my life, right? So conviction is necessary and conviction is godly, right? And so you don't want to resist conviction. You don't want to resist uh, what conviction tells you that you're wrong when you do something that's wrong. You want to work in that conviction. Now, condemnation on the other hand is not about the sin. It's about you. Right? So condemnation speaks to you and who you are. So condemnation would say things to, to would make you feel condemnation doesn't make you feel bad about the sin. It makes you feel bad about yourself. Condemnation may call, tells you that you're worthless. Condemnation tells you that God doesn't love you. Condemnation tells you that you're useless, that you can't be used to God, that God doesn't love you, that you're just some uh, some uh, worthless, useless sinner, and God has never God has has uh, no use for you. So that's condemnation. And I experienced when I was struggling with homosexuality, especially before I got saved, but. But then, of course, sure, guys, I got saved too. But when I was struggling with homosexuality, I had the conviction and the condemnation. So I knew that it was wrong. That's why nobody can talk me into it. And uh, I know the culture is a whole lot different today. Uh, there's a, a, a whole lot of support uh, to be a homosexual, and there wasn't as much support back then. But I still have friends that was telling me, hey, this is who you are. This is the way you are supposed to be, so you just need to accept it. Well, I couldn't do that because I had the conviction, right? But on the other hand, I had the condemnation that talked to me about me, telling me that I'm useless, I'm worthless, I'm inferior. That's condemnation. That's the thing that you are supposed to resist as a believer because that doesn't come from God. God doesn't even condemn sinners, and we'll see... Uh, that in a little bit, and we will see what condemns sinners, but God doesn't even condemn sinners, so you know he's not going to condemn Christians. So that's why I want to take a few minutes today to talk about condemnation, because I want you, because we, you, this, this series uh, culture, counterculture, is going to get uh, heavy, because we're going to be talking about some ideologies, and we're going to be talking about them from scripture, there's some things that we're going to be refuting, and if you are, if you have that ideology and you act according to that ideology, or you've had that ideology and you act according to the ideology, or if you just act in a certain way because you were afraid, maybe you did believe uh, in abortion when you had that one, but maybe you was 16 or 17 or 18 or 21 and you were just afraid and you didn't know what to do. Uh, no job, no no support, nothing. You didn't know what to do. And then maybe you got a hold of some literature or maybe somebody told you, hey, I, got, I know what you can do. And, and maybe you went to that abortion clinic and had that abortion with everything in you screaming, no, 
don't do it. But you did it because you were fearful, right? And so when we if we talk about abortion and we talk about it straight up, see, I have to be able to talk about things straight up in this series. I can't come through the back door. I have to come straight to, to coming to the front door. And I got to be straight about what I'm talking about in order for you to get it, especially this day and age. But if when, you, when you're straight about the truth, there is the potential that the enemy would use that to bring combination. So that's why I want to talk about combination today so that hopefully I can get that in you and then you can decide, or you can receive it, and then when the enemy tries to bring the combination, you can say, hey, I'm taking the truth of God's word without the combination. And that's the way that God has, has trained me and delivered me and, and got me set up that way so that I can hear the truth and I don't have to receive the combination. Now, it doesn't mean that the combination doesn't come, but I can resist it and I can say, no, I'm not going to be condemned because there is no combination in me. So let's start. I got a few scriptures. Let's start with John 3, uh, 16. That's one of the most... Uh, the one of the first which we learned, we learned, right, along with um, the 23rd Psalm, I'm going to be King James Version today. But that's one of the first which we learned, learned for God so loved the world. So we all know that. Didn't know what it meant when we read it or when we learned it, but it finally hit us and it finally came to light. So John 3.16, King James Version. Um, it says, um, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now that we know. We don't often go beyond that a lot of times, but that we know. We know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him, uh, uh, whosoever believes in him um, should not perish but have everlasting life. Right? Okay, so whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right? So that's what it means. That's what you have to do to not perish. That's what you have to do to have everlasting life is to genuinely believe on him. Who said believe is on him. So believe, to genuinely believe on Jesus and what Jesus has done, right? And that's how you have everlasting life. That's how you do not perish. Amen? Amen. So, so, but here's the thing, though. Sometimes, Sometimes, and everybody can relate to this, and you say you can't relate, I'm just going to tell you a lie. Because everybody can relate to this. You're born again, and you may even have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. You may be a tongue talker, but you do things that are against the Word of God. You do things that you don't have any business doing. You say things you don't have any business saying. Now, you may have some things, certain things that I've had. You know, like, you may not be involved in adultery. You may not lie, or whatever the case may be. You may have some things that I've had, but there are some things, you know, you can be, you can be sinning because you disobey God, because God tells you to do something. He tells you to go somewhere. He tells you to go over here and witness somebody. He tells you to give this person $20 for some food or whatever the case may be and if you neglect to do that you have sinned, right? And the Bible says, remember the Bible says that God this law, it wasn't just the Ten Commandments if you want to live by the law, it's not just the Ten Commandments, so but the Bible says if you have been offended in one of uh, just one thing in the law. If you are missing one thing in the law, if you're not doing one thing in the law, then you are guilty of all. Of, of all the law, right? So, you know, this person may uh, not be, I mean, you may have been doing all of this. Maybe you are 95%, you know, keeping the law. And uh, and then uh, the five, other 5%, you off. Well, you offer the whole thing. Amen. But see, that's something we don't have to be concerned about because we are not of the law. We do not, we're not under the law. We are under grace. Amen. But just to let you know though, that even under grace, we do things, we say things that we don't have any business saying, any business doing, right? So you could be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, whatever speaking of times, and doing things that are wrong. So let me just say it this way. You could be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, whatever speaking of times, and sinning, right? 
And so there's an opportunity for condemnation to come in. Now, just because you're doing things that are wrong doesn't mean that you're not saved. It doesn't mean that you've lost your salvation. I tell you, I got the, I think I got the greatest story in the world when back in 19, I think it was about 86, I've been um, in 84 when I got saved, got filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. Uh, people prophesied over me, got baptized in water, and um, then um, and, uh, prayed over me concerning homosexuality. Homo so that was gone. And then in 86, uh, it started, I can, I didn't know what to do, but I can feel, I, I just can sense it, you know, coming back, coming back. And then it came back, I yielded to it. But from 86 to, from the time that, that homosexuality came back into my life, I took it, I received it. So I don't want to make it, I don't want to make it like I was completely innocent. I yield to it, right? But from 86 to 89, when God delivered me again and took eight and told me what to do to stay delivered, he talked to me. And I, I was listening to Facebook uh, probably, I don't know, about a week or so ago. And there's a guy on there talking about that. You know, he's like essentially saying God doesn't talk to people, you know, which is just dumb. It's just dumb. <laughs> dumb, dumb, dumb. Anyway, I mean, how on earth did you, I'm not saying that he taught him that day, but as you preaching, how are you getting these sermons? How do you know you were called to preach? You know, how do you know? If you just, you just up there doing something, if you just up there doing something, you shouldn't even be up there. The guy that, this guy that said this would say that he was called to preach. Well, how do you know that? Who told you that? Who told you that? So anyway, um, but the thing about it is that during that period of time when I was involved in homosexuality, like the guy that has has gone has has gone through great events to get me delivered, to get me set free, to deal with me, then I just turned back into it, and he's talked with me during that whole time, just just let me know he didn't relax his stand on homosexuality. Homosexuality was still a sin. That's not how he came at me. But he let me know that he was still with me, that he had not removed his presence from me, his spirit from me, that he still loved me, all sorts of good stuff. So to me, that's one of the greatest testimonies that I have, is that when I was going through the worst that I think, in my opinion, that's the worst that I've ever been through in my whole life. So when I was going through that at my darkest, at my lowest, God was there. And not only was he, he wasn't silent. He wasn't a silent partner. He wasn't just sitting by watching me go through stuff. He was talking to me. He was encouraging me. And it was him that led me to the very place uh, that July Sunday, 1989 in Denver, Colorado. I was there because God was leading me. Because he, he, he led me to that place. And that was the place that I received my deliverance at this time was permanent because then I started talking to God and said, hey, how can I stop this? And, and one of my biggest problems was condemnation, right? And so, so, so we know that, that things can happen to us, that we're not, we're not, I'm not, it's, I'm not preaching perfection. I'm not preaching for you to be perfect, for you to never do anything wrong. I'm not preaching for you to um, never have anything going on in your life that's ungodly. But we can we cannot pretend that we are doing right stuff when we are not doing right stuff. So we have to know what is right, what is wrong, and then we have to acknowledge that. If we are doing wrong things, we have to be able to know that I'm doing something wrong without it condemning me. We have to be able to take the conviction without the condemnation. That's a mature, that's a part of maturity. That's growing up. That's growing up because God wants to be able to come at you anytime he needs you to tell you the truth about something. Without it put you in the in, in the dark place for about a month or two. You see, and uh, and if he can't do that, he won't do that. He's not going to put you in this dark place for two or three months because he said something to you uh, that was true. He's going to, he's going to Get you to the point where you can handle it. Remember he told his disciples, you know, there was a lot that I could have said to you. 
that I, if you put what I can say to you in books, it would just fill this this earth, right? But he said, but there was some, there are some things that you can't take, right? There are some things that we can't take, but we don't want to always be in that place where I can't take this. I want to get to the point where I can take it because it's the truth that's going to set you free. And the more that you can take, the freer you're going to be. The more truth you can take, the freer you're going to be. The more successful you're going to be. The more prosperous you're going to be. And I'm not just talking about money. Spirit, soul, and body. That's what we want. Spirit, soul, and body prosperity. So, But all that is, is based on the truth that we are able to receive and comply with. Amen. Glory be to God. So in verse, so when it comes to condemnation, in verse 17, John 3, verse 17, it says, For God sent not his son to the world to condemn the world. Now we talk about the world. We are, we're not even talking about Christ. There were none. When God sent his son into the world, there was none. As a matter of fact, there was none righteous the Bible season. And out of all those guys, you know, you all you think about John the Baptist, you think about uh, uh, Zechariah, think about even Mary, and yet the Bible still says before Jesus, before he did what he did to make us righteous as we receive, there is none righteous, no, not one. All have fallen short. Uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? And, and so when he came, he didn't come to sinners, so he came to, I mean, he didn't come to Christians, he didn't come to believers, he didn't come to the righteous, he came for the world, for sinners, and yet he was not sent to condemn the world. So he didn't even come to condemn the people who were in sin. So if you are born again, and, and, and you are being presented with truth, you must understand that that truth is not coming to condemn you. So if you are receiving condemnation, it's not the condemnation is not coming from the truth. It's coming from the enemy who wants to present you from prevent you, excuse me, from receiving that truth. Amen. So for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but why? But that the world through him might be saved. So what does that tell us? That tells us that salvation and condemnation are mutually exclusive. Because he says, I didn't sin for condemnation, I sinned for salvation. So salvation and condemnation are mutually exclusive. So as a saved individual, you are not to be condemned. And you got to know that. And you got to stand up when the condemnation comes. And the condemnation comes, remember, the conviction is just telling you, you're wrong. Now you need to be able to accept that. You're wrong, don't resist conviction. But the condemnation says you're useless, you're worthless, you're no good. That's what condemnation is. I had this um, this uh, guy that I worked with years. Oh, I said years ago. Probably it was, it was maybe I don't know seven eight years ago. But anyway, he um, he had a sister who was on drugs, and uh, you know the sister had done all kinds of stuff, um, you know stealing, you know all kinds of stuff. And so he was upset with her, and he was talking to me. He said she's just worthless. Is what he said to me. And I said, no, don't say that. I said, because Jesus died for her. He died for her. So don't call her words. Now, you can disagree with what she's doing. And, and you can, but now you're speaking about the person. You're making a judgment about the person. See, that's the difference. And we got to be able to discern that. It's the, the difference between <laughs> conviction, conviction is about what I am doing. And people in this day and age, when you talk about what they are doing, when you say that this is wrong, they equate that, they conflate that, if you will, with you talking about them as a person. So when you don't validate what they do, when you don't agree with what they do, then you become uh, judgmental to them. You become uh, phobic to them, right? And so, and so, but 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 so he, but now when he's called her worthless. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's um, in your mind the worst sin on the planet. You can't call people worthless. You can't call them condemned because that's not why Jesus came, even for the world. So the very worst of sin. Now we're going to see that condemnation does come. We're going to see why in a minute. But the very worst of sinners, Jesus came not to condemn. So we can't do that. We can't do that. So we got to be able to talk about these things. 
without talking about people, if you know what I mean. Right? And so, um, and I've seen, you know, people on YouTube, and I've seen people uh, on, on uh, Facebook, and you see the comments, and you see Christians are commenting as well, and they, they don't have this principle. Instead of making it about the concept, instead of making it about the ideology, instead of making it about the, the idea, you know, instead of saying, um, Homosexuality is wrong, but bullshit is wrong. Now they, they move from that to attacking the person. And start calling the person a snowflake. You've heard of that. Snowflakes and just all sorts of things. So now when you get into name calling, you left the calling of God. So you need to get out of off that off of that Facebook, off that YouTube. Make it about the ideology. Make it about the ideas that people are um, perpetrating in our culture, not about the person itself. So, so he did not come to condemn the world, but now listen to how condemnation comes. Uh, verse 18, so he that believes on him is not condemned. So that is the way you stay with the condemnation. If you believe on God, you believe on Jesus, and you know you do, then don't let condemnation in. And just because you believe on him, it does it means that you're not condemned, but it doesn't mean that the combination will try to get in. So you could be walking around condemned, and that's not what you're supposed to be. You could be walking around condemned as a Christian, you're trapped, you're in prison in combination, and that's not the will of God for your life. So then he says that um, uh, he that believeth on him is not condemned. But here is the uh, combination. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now let me tell you why that is. Okay? Because, see, here's the thing. You remember that scripture when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father without me, right? And the reason that is because when he's not saying, um, my father has determined that I am the way, the truth, and the life. He ain't going to accept nothing else. He can't accept anything else. Because Jesus is the only one that paid the price. There is no other way. It's not an opinion. It's not an opinion. It's the truth. There is no other way. Jesus paid the price. Jesus paid the penalty. Jesus went to the cross. I believe that he also descended into Hell, but this controversial about that, so I won't be dogmatic about that. But he paid the the bottom line that we that we can all agree on is that he paid the penalty for sin. Amen. Because justice has to be satisfied. God has divine justice, right? And divine justice is not you go to jail for twenty years. Divine justice is that you die and go to hell. That's what. Justice is to God, right? And so, she, so, so Jesus satisfied that. That's why this scripture says that you have been, we've been redeemed from wrath, right? Because Jesus satisfied the justified anger of God. God was justified when he was angry. He was justified. And so Jesus satisfied that. Amen. And, and so that's why if you don't believe on Jesus, you're going to be condemned because there is no other way for you to not be condemned. Right? So believe on Jesus because we were all headed for condemnation. God came up with his plan. Of course, he did it for the foundation of earth with Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Holy the Lamb of God, who was slain for the foundation of the earth, before the foundation of the earth. So God has that plan. If it were not for that, we will all be condemned, right? So, so if you don't believe on Jesus, if you don't believe on the one who took condemnation away, who came not to condemn, then what's left? Condemnation, right? But see, we in here, and many of those who are watching by Facebook, we, we believe on Jesus. And so we are not condemned and we cannot let condemnation come our way. So why would people not believe on Jesus and, and remain in condemnation instead? It's their choice. He says in verse 19, and this is the condemnation, that their light 
is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than, than light, because their deeds were evil. Right? For everyone, verse 20, everyone that does evil, evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, unless his deeds should be reproved. Or rebuked or, or revealed, shown, right? So he's saying that people who refuse to walk in the light, who refuse to receive the light and continue to embrace the darkness, right? He said that that's when that's condemnation. That's when condemnation comes. But if you just sin and, and you, you, you made a mistake or uh, 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 what have you, um, and the light comes and you let the light in, and you repent, there's no condemnation, right? There is no condemnation uh, to those who are in Christ Jesus. But anyway, so so uh, uh, 3, uh, 16, John 3, 16 through 20 is what we just did. Let's look at John 8 real quick. Now, this is the story about the woman who they had taken in, I don't know, I believe, you see. Okay, so let's start with verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what did you what do you say? Now of course they, they called him master, but they uh, didn't consider him that. And they only did this to catch him in something. So they they didn't care about the woman. They left the man where he was because she can't you can't commit a dutch by yourself. So they, they just brought the poor little woman. They didn't even mess with the man. So all sorts of things going on here. That's not right. But 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 mainly though, they just trying to catch Jesus. This they said, verse six, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground as though he did not hurt them. So I like that. I like that. I like that. I like that because. What's happening here is that Jesus is not allowing them and their questions to govern him, right? So when it says that he acts like he didn't hear them, he really did act like he didn't hear them because he's not going to let them. He answers, and this is the way we should be. He answers to God. Amen. And you know, he probably listened to somebody who were uh, with God, you know, compliant with God. You know, these guys were so he's not going to let them pull him off of his focus, put him off of his uh, commitment, his relationship with God. So he's just right in the sand. Of course, he's hearing from God because he said, I don't only say what I hear my father say. So what he's getting ready to say is going to come from God. Verse 7, so when they continue asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let them first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Verse 9. And that's that's the word. That's that's him acting in faith. Because he didn't. It, t it, it takes faith. Now, he knew that none of them could cast a stone. But but he didn't know if they would cast a stone anyway. So he's believing that they are going to heed that word that he just spoke. And God used that word to cut them to their heart. Amen. And so it says that... Uh, um, verse 9, and, and they heard, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the elders, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and a woman standing in his midst, right? And uh, now, of course, it's interesting that Jesus is left alone because Jesus is the only one who wasn't guilty of that sin. So he could stay. He won't go cast no stone anyway. But he could stay. He didn't have to leave. And so then, in verse um, 10, now here's the question. So now, because we talk about condemnation, we bring it home. When Jesus had lifted up her voice, now you need to understand, this is a woman 
who has been caught in the very act of adultery. She has no defense. She was caught. She can't lie about it. She can't say I didn't do it. There's witnesses that say she did this. We caught her. And the penalty was to, to stone her. To stone her to death, right? And so, so, so that would have been the condemnation. We're going to stone her to death, right? So Jesus said, woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? See, they were not after conviction. They were after condemnation. So they were trying to convict her. They were trying to condemn her. And for them, condemnation looked like killing. Let's throw stones. Let's throw stones. But not only were they not, well, not only were they trying to condemn her, they was trying to condemn Jesus in the process. So she said, she said, no, no man, Lord. And here's what Jesus says. Neither do I condemn you, the woman in adultery. Neither do I condemn you, the woman who has had an abortion. Maybe more than one. Neither do I condemn you. The one, the per, the, the homosexual, the right now homosexual, not the one that used to be a homosexual, the one who's a homosexual now. Now he did not tell her that what she did was right. He did not tell her, he did not condone her sin, he, but he just refused to condemn her because that's not why he came. And that is not the function of the church either. That's not why we are here. We are not here to condemn. But you got to understand that just merely telling the truth and merely standing on the truth does not equate to condemnation. People can conflate it that way because they're so connected to what they are doing that when you say something about the sin, in their mind, you are saying something about them. And so they take it that way and they feel condemned. Again, this is why I'm bringing this so that you won't receive that condemnation when you hear truth that runs counter to what you have been doing. And now you are being called on the carpet, so to speak, by the truth to make a change. And then condemnation wants to get in there and prevent the change. That's the way the enemy uses condemnation, is to prevent the change that God is trying to um, bring to you by revealing the truth to you. Amen. And so, just a couple more scriptures. I got a few, but just a couple more and we'll be done. Because I think I'm making my point. So let's look at Romans 8. Romans 8. 1. Now this is the scripture. And I told you that I was um, delivered from homosexuality back in 84. Went back into it in 86. And then 89, God delivered me again. And so now I'm saying, okay, God, how am I going to stay out of this? Because I can't do this again. I won't make it. I won't make it. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a husband. I wanted to have children. I wanted to be a father. I wanted to be in ministry. And I know that I could not do that. I know today they say you can, but it's not true. It's not true. God is not calling you into ministry. Now, he may call you to ministry while you're on the because he did me. But he's going to, he intends to, to clean you up, to put you out there. Right? And so, and so, um, so, so I got to the point where I can't do it anymore. And I know that being get born again is not enough. Now that may sound bad, but it wasn't enough. I was born again. It did not stop me from engaging in homosexuality. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. It did not stop me from engaging in homosexuality. Right? So what stopped me is that I, when I started praying to God, he said that there's something wrong with your mind. It's your mind that is drawing you back out there because you have certain uh, um, strongholds in your mind that's preventing you from staying free. And so he started dealing with me about what those were. And the biggest one, I would say that 99% of the, maybe 100%, but the biggest one was the condemnation that I was keeping upon myself because of the lifestyle that I had built before I got saved. I could not get over. Initially, until God showed me, initially I could not get over that I had been involved with homosexuality. I didn't like it. I thought that it was just the worst thing in the world. I thought that I was the worst person. See, there's the condemnation coming. Right? I mean, it's one thing for you to think that homosexuality 
is the worst thing in the world. It's another thing for you to think you are the worst person that ever lived because you were involved in homosexuality, right? Can I tell you, can I share a secret with you? When it comes to worse, when it comes to bad, everybody who has ever lived is side by side. <laughs> you know, there ain't, so you can't, it can't be I'm the worst, I'm the best when it comes to sin and evil. Because we've all, before, before God got a hold of us, we've all been there. And remember, in, in, in God's eyes, one thing is as bad as the other. To a degree, right? So, so, so I thought that I was, I'd done the worst thing in the world, and now I was the worst person in the world. So that's that condemnation, right? And see what condemnation does, God shared this with me, is that what condemnation does, you cannot be strong when you are condemned. You cannot be victorious when you are condemned. You cannot fight when you are condemned. So you get to the point where, and, here, and here's, here's that, where that little song, by doors they might come into play. Hey, Sarah, Sarah, whatever would be, would be. Because when you are condemned, you don't fight. You don't fight for your destiny. You don't fight for the word that God has given you. You don't fight for, um, you know, God to give me a word. I, I, you would be a father and a, a um, no, 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 a husband first. You would be a husband, a father, and a, and a preacher, right? He had given me that word when I was a little boy. And by this time, when homosexuality came back on me, I understood that that word came from God. I didn't know before that, but I understood, right? And so, so then, because of the condemnation, I don't even have the strength to fight. I don't have the power. I don't have the, the ability, the wherewithal, and in, any, and in some cases, I didn't even have the desire to fight for the word that God had given me. To contend, it's not just going to automatically happen. You have to contend for these things. But the condemnation that comes, it does it, 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 it saps you of that strength and that ability and that fighting spirit to go and take what God has given you, right? And so, and so, and so, and so, and then, so, so now, I, I know, at that time, I know that homosexuality is in the way. I know that I can't be a husband, not the husband I want to be. I know today you can do that sort of thing by law, but not the husband I want to be. I want to be a husband to a woman. So I knew that I could not be that as a, as a homosexual, because I wasn't the type that, that's going to marry somebody to die alone. Now that I wasn't going to do. Right? So I knew I could not be a husband, and I knew I could not be a father, and I knew I could not go into the ministry uh, with, with homosexuality. So this is the thing that I need to stand against, and yet I could not. I could not. I just let it come back in, and it was because I was so condemned. So, so, so that was the very, when I asked him what, what was wrong, that was the thing that he went to. Off the bat, it's the condemnation that you have been dealing with all your life. Ever since this demon of homosexuality has come to your life, that's you've been dealing with the homosexual. I mean, that condemnation. And when I got born again, the, the, the person who prayed with me to receive Jesus, they prayed about the homosexuality, and they prayed about that, but they didn't pray about the condemnation. And you really can't pray condemnation away. You have to stand on the word of God for condemnation. You, when the enemy comes to you with condemnation, you have to be able to stand and say, I will not be condemned because of Romans 8, 1, which I'm getting ready to read it. You know it anyway. I will not be condemned, right? And the feeling may come, you just keep at it. Keep at it with that word. And then I'm telling you the condemnation will leave. I don't get condemned about anything now. And, you know, the feelings may come, but I'm going to stop it. I'm going to stop because I know how dangerous condemnation is. It's a snake. It's a it's a, a, a rattlesnake. It is extremely dangerous. So I don't get condemned about anything. And that's not because I do everything right. It's because I'm not, because of the principle that God has given me, uh, has given us, excuse me. So Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Zero. And if you are in Christ Jesus, no condemnation. And that was the scripture that God gave me. And every time I felt like that I was being condemned about something and condemnation, 
Again, it's coming at you. It's, 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 it's talking about you, the person. You know, how useless you are. I mean, I mean, for God so loved the world, I mean, how much better can you get than that? How much better can you get than that? Yeah, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're acting like this, you're acting like that. But why would you consider yourself worthless when God thought enough of you to send his only begotten son? Who do you consider worthy enough to give your child to for? Ah, nobody. Nobody. Absolutely nobody. Right? You give your life for your child if you had to. But you ain't giving your child life. So how could you, especially those of us that are born again, I have to learn this, how could we let the enemy condemn us when God has already taken care of that? He could have just, he could have just condemned us, wiped us out and said, you know, I'm just done with it. This, this, was, this wasn't a good idea. I'm just done with them. But no, he sent his only begotten son, and, and he would even condemn the sinners that he sent them to. Amen. So let's do this one, this one last one. Uh, 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 first John 1 9. And uh, right before I do this, I'm just read this. I'm not going to explain this. I'm just going to read this. And this will help you. He says, verse 31, 8 31, Romans 8 31. I'm just going to read it. No, no, uh, it's found in. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? 32. Just, just, just listen to it. If you can write down. I'm, a, I'm reading 831. Romans 8, 31 through 39. So if you can write that down because I'm just going to read it. And go back and read it for yourself and, and meditate on it. it. This would definitely help you with condemnation. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. Yeah, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now, when he said, who is he that condemned? And then he said, it is Christ. He's not even saying Christ condemned. He, it's like he's saying, who are you to condemn when it is Christ who died? You see? Um, and then uh, verse um, uh, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Because that's ultimately what condemnation says to you. God does not love you. That's ultimately what it says to you. So who can separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So basically what he is saying is nothing, nothing shall be able to separate you from the love of God, even you, even the stuff that you do, even your wrongdoing, even your sin. So we need to be able to hear the truth that's going to deliver us from that sin. So you see the cycle that the enemy wants to lock us in is that God's bringing the truth so you could be delivered from the sin, but the enemy is using the sin to condemn you so that you won't receive the truth to be delivered from the sin. Right? So that's the that's the weapon of condemnation that he uses against us. Amen. So let's close with John, 1 John 1 9. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. It got so many. That's why I said one of. It got many, 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 many. So, um, first John 1 9, near the end. Okay. So, all right. So, it says, um, let's start with verse 8. Um, if we say that we have no sin, now he is writing to believers. He ain't right, he's not right to the world. All right. So, if we say that we have no sin, 
we deceived ourselves that the truth is not in us. So he said, don't lie. If you if you screwed up, don't lie. You, you did. You did. Amen. And see, because of, because of this truth that we don't have to be condemned, you can admit stuff. You can admit stuff to yourself. You can fall. You can admit that you're not perfect. You can admit that you that you uh, gossip the other day. You shit. You can admit all kinds of stuff because I want to be free. So I'm facing. You know, alcoholic anonymous. They say one. The first step is to admit, right? So I'm facing the things that I'm doing. I'm facing the things that I'm dealing with that I'm doing, not necessarily what somebody's doing to me. I'm facing it, and I'm able to face it without condemnation. And if I could do that, then I could be helped. God can help me. So in verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, this is this. He is faithful, right? So faithful means that he is dependable. He, you can depend on him every single time. They told me when I was growing up, God going to get tired of you doing that stuff. He's going to get tired of you. He's going to get tired of you. But this says that I'm a, if I'm a believer and I am um, sinning and I ask him, Right? He is faithful if I confess it. If I'm genuine and I'm sincere, he is faithful. That means every single time. And I don't see anything in this scripture that, that gives me a time limit. Now, you know, you don't want to keep doing stuff, but you know, and, 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 and if you are born again and you live in by grace, you're not going to want to keep doing stuff because you're going to be convicted. And you don't like, you don't like, you know, you don't, you don't, you're not going to be comfortable about remaining that sin. That's one of the things that will cause you to confess. So if you confess our sin, he is faithful. So that means he'll do it every time. And I like this one. This is this is why I like this scripture. And just to forgive, to forgive um, us our sins. Now, just means that it is the right thing to do. Right? So how on earth can forgiveness be the right thing to do, you know, for God, like, like, okay, you would think that would be merciful, like he's being merciful to me. I sinned, I did something wrong. I'm coming to God to receive forgiveness. I, I'm not in a position to uh, claim that position. I mean, that forgiveness to expect God to forgive me. If I get it, it's merciful. But he doesn't say that. He doesn't say it's merciful. He says it's just. And just means that it's not the merciful or the gracious thing to do. It is the right thing to do, right? So it is right for God to forgive us. He is supposed to forgive us when we confess our sins. Now, why is that? It is because of the grace, right? So it's not, it, 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 it's, it's founded on grace that he forgives us, but it's right for him to do it. So if I come to him to receive forgiveness, after I confess my sins, the answer is always yes. It is never no. It is never no. And when you walk away from that, the enemy could, would tell you that God can forgive you. He didn't hear you. And that's when the condemnation, condemnation can set in. So it's important for us to know that we are forgiven. What causes us to be forgiven? To, to have that as our right. It's a right. So what causes us to have that? It's because of what Jesus has done. So when you stand before God confessing your sins and receiving forgiveness, I don't. I take forgiveness. You know, I, this may sound sacrilegious to some people, but if I, if I sin, I'm going to confess and going to repent, and then I'm going to expect forgiveness. So I take it. I take it out of bed for it. I don't really even ask for it. I just, I say, Lord, I thank you for forgiving me because I know that he doesn't lie. And he told me that if I confess, He's just. He's faithful. He's just to forgive me. Faithful. Just. Faithful. I can depend on it just because it's the right thing for him to do. Amen. So we receive your forgiveness from God. Your clean slate. He said he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So with that forgiveness comes cleansing. Comes a clean slate. And then don't let the enemy pile anything on there. Don't let the enemy pile condemnation on you. Amen. So again, I want to bring to you a word on condemnation so that as we continue to talk culture, our uh, culture and counterculture and the things that we as believers should stand up against, I know that some of us are doing those things that I'm saying that we should stand up against and so or have done those things. And so as a result of that, 
condemnation can come and can block you from hearing and applying the truth. So I want us to be able to deal with condemnation when the enemy brings it so that we can be set free by the truth that we know, which we will not know if we allow condemnation to get in the way. Amen? All right. So that's it. So what we're going to do now is receive our communion. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. We thank you for this word, Father God. It's always good to hear that we're not condemned. It's a very important message, Father God. Uh, that combination stops us from receiving grace. It stops us from walking in grace. It pushes us to the law and try to make us law abiding, um, you know, that sort of thing, or under the law. So uh, it's so important, Father God. It keeps us from hearing the truth, it keeps us from being free. It's extremely dangerous. So it's so important for us to be able to hear the truth about combination. I pray that everybody that has heard this word, Father God, that it would be something that rings in their spirit, Father God, and, and, and that's something that just goes over and over in their minds, Lord God, until they get it, they, until they are convinced of this word so that they will not allow combination to rob them, Father God. So, Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for that. And as we take communion, we are grateful to be able to take communion today. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. We are grateful for Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We are grateful for all that he has done. And when we take communion, that's what we are doing. We are remembering Jesus. Remember what he has done for us and what he continues to do. For the word of God says that he ever sits at the right hand of the Father, ever make an intercession for us. So he continues doing things. And not only that, what he has done is in full effect for us today, Father God, in the name of Jesus. So we remember with gratitude, always grateful, always grateful, always grateful. So no matter what is going on in our life that might inspire us to want to mumble, mumble and complain, Lord God, we can remember what Jesus has done and it can turn that and we can be grateful. So grateful to Jesus, so grateful. And also, we take communion, we remember with expectation in faith, and that is that we are expecting what we are remembering. We are expecting what Jesus has done to come upon us. Hallelujah, glory be to God, and to be uh, evident in our lives. And so we praise you, we glorify you, we magnify you, we honor you, we lift you up. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy your grace, your truth, your kindness, and your generosity. We love you, Father God. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. So coming from 1 Corinthians 11, again from the King James Version, beginning with uh, verse 23, For I receive of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you. So this is Paul, and he received this by revelation, because he wasn't a part of the Last Supper. So I receive from the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So let's take it. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm. Verse 25. After the same manner, he, he also took the cup which he had, when he had supped. Saying, this cup is the New Testament and my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. Let's take it. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Thank you all for joining us on Facebook. You guys have a God day today. Amen. A day where God is in control and calls shots. In Jesus' name. Amen.